the chapter chair. And I just want to give a little uh, bit of a welcome here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Microsoft uh, for providing this uh, fantastic venue. Uh, Kyle from uh, Microsoft is uh, in the back somewhere. Oh, no, he's over here on the side. Uh, and Kyle asked me actually uh, to just mention that um, for any of you who are interested, that he'd be happy to explain Microsoft's uh, Biz Sparks program, uh, which is uh, something he knows quite a bit more about than I do. So uh, I, I invite you to seek him out uh, after the program. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Fitzpatrick and Hunt for providing the uh, delicious refreshments. Uh, and I'd also like to recognize uh, Cognito for the uh, work that they did in uh, helping us with the public relations for this event. Uh, I want to give a couple of uh, quick um, comments on our upcoming programs. On May 22nd, we have a program uh, called Driving Consumer Adoption of uh, Mobile Content. Uh, on June 7th, we have Big Data in Bioscience. And on June 19th, uh, we have Secrets of Digital Success in the Big Apple. And also, uh, sometime in uh, in June, we're going to have a kind of a membership volunteer event where we um, uh, are going to do some brainstorming for next year's event. So I, I encourage uh, those of you who are members or anybody really who wants to come uh, to that event, um, and you know you can sort of uh, have your voice heard in terms of uh, what it is that we're doing in the organization. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Dolan, who's going to talk a little bit about tonight's program and introduce the moderator. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, as you know, we have a fabulous panel. We have Pulitzer Prize winner, we have uh, Emmy Award winner, motocross uh, champion here, um, 30 under 30 entrepreneur here, uh, just amazing uh, panelists. So first I'm going to introduce um, Larry, who is our moderator for this evening, and I'll let him take it from there. So Larry was the chairman and CEO and founder of Market Watch, uh, until it sold to uh, Dow Jones. He's currently an adjunct professor of media management at the Newhouse School of Communications at Syracuse University. He's the author of Seascape, Conquer the Forces of Changing Business Today. He was the first president of CBS Digital Media, and he serves on a lot of boards, Discovery, American Media, Freedom Communications, Opinions, Black Arrow, Harvard Business School Publishing, Newhouse, um, Minionville, Cross Borders, Jib Jab Media, I'm sure there's more, and he's the founding member of the Form, and the former chairman of the Online Pre uh, Publishers Association. And with that, I'll let you introduce the rest of the board. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming today. Um, this is going to be an interesting panel, I think. I know a couple of the people on the panel from uh, previous uh, incarnations, and uh, I'm going to let them, ex uh, I'm going to let everybody in the panel tell you their own story for starters here. But before I do, um, let me just tell you that there's a wonderful similarity in all of them in that. All of us, really, the five of us, really went the route of joining traditional companies and working in financial, in and around financial services uh, uh, at the beginning of our careers, some for longer than others, um, and, and ultimately went the route of becoming an entrepreneur um, and starting our own companies. The, the, uh, we're at really all different levels of financial services from, you know, consumer uh, straight up to very uh, complex um, program trading uh, and, and uh, quantitative news. Um, so there's, I think there's an interesting contrast, but the similarities are really striking when you think about the fact that really, uh, um, although we're all New Yorkers, everybody here actually started their businesses in New York except me. I started, I, I moved to San Francisco to start mine. Um, and uh, because I was partners with CBS in it, it was, it was just far enough away for me to succeed um, and without having uh, um, to deal with the big company in the media world. Um, but I think you'll find from their stories, which are quite interesting, um, that they've all, they've all gone through different, um, uh, they've, all, they've all found different challenges. They've all uh, uh, done things that people in New York thought couldn't be done. Everybody thought you had to go to Silicon Valley to start businesses and they all proved that it wasn't true. Um, and they've all managed to take what they've learned in traditional media and really take the next step and, mer and, and go further into, um, uh, into business by um, basically taking what they've learned and, and, and taking three or four steps further. Uh, because becoming more pliable, becoming more entrepreneurial, uh, enabled them to, to um, go beyond what they had seen at places before. And they're all in businesses that are still here, which 
over the past few years is not easy. Uh, so let me just give you two, a minute, uh, less than a minute um, on each. You've got, I think everybody's got the names of the panel and a little bit of description, so I don't have to go through it, but I'll go from the left and, and um, you can, you can uh, match the name of the face once and then you're, you're ready. Um, but Brian Terpstra, I actually met 2003, would you say? Yeah. Brian was an undergraduate at, uh, um, in, in Miami of Ohio, and I was uh, lecturing in a class there. A friend of mine was teaching, and I, he brought me in to do a lecture. Um, and I was, I, I was amazingly impressed at this class. This class asked just terrific questions. It was really a, um, a bunch of hungry kids really wanting to, to eat <laughs> and get into the business. And uh, you know, I knew that there'd be a lot of success there. I knew these. I, I was stunned by the fact that when I uh, we were talking a, a, at a break about vacation, I think this was the class because I spoke to a few. But, and I said, well, uh, they were they I said, what are you guys going to do on vacation? They're all going off to vacation. So we're going to drive down to I don't know Dustin or some place on on the on the Gulf. And I said, well, you know, why don't you guys like fly to Hawaii or go somewhere really cool? And, I, after a quick survey, I realized that uh, uh, all but two of them had never been on an airplane. Um, this was middle America at its best, and and these and here's Ryan in New York in the nicest suit in the of the bunch. I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not way. So Ryan is uh, Ryan went to work for Reuters, and he'll tell you more about how he got to where he did. Um, Peter, the most casually dressed of us, I think, and. Uh, is a CEO of Axial Market, and he had, and, and an activist in his own active active athlete in his own way too. But he'll talk a lot about his world, and his world's more of a B two B company that you're in now, right? B two B business. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Todd Harrison, and I also go way back. I'm on the board of Minion Village. You heard, which is Todd's company, and Todd's really um, uh, Todd came right out of the hedge fund world. Um, some of you may have already read his book about his life there, and. Uh, and started Minionville almost 10 years ago now. About 10 years ago, sure. Wow, which is just amazing. Uh, and and Minionville just deals is more of a consumer business like mine was, like Market Watch was, but but it's actually got several levels, and he'll tell you a little bit about uh, about that, I think. Um, and Philippe, of course, is uh, our really our I guess you're sort of our sponsor tonight, right? One of our sponsors or a big sponsor tonight. Um, but Philippe is a uh, is in the most. Uh, Highly technical of the businesses here. He's in, he's built a, um, uh, a company that does uh, uh, global trading, really uh, electron trading, and he can talk about that too. But his but he came out of that space and out of a highly technical space. And his story about you know why New York and what made it such an attractive place for him to start his business is really um, fantastic. And I'll when they're all done, if they are if they're done, I'll uh, get in a little bit about uh, Market Watch too and how that got started, even though it was in that other place. On the other side of the country. So why don't you start us off? Youngest goes first, right? Okay, great. So do you want the background of kind of how Larry started and, and where I started off my career? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as Larry said, I was a student at Miami of Ohio with a great entrepreneurship program, and um, some of the things that I did in between. Summers at uh, at Miami Ohio was uh, I was an intern for Thompson, so I worked in a number of business development roles, and um, actually became close with a mentor at Miami of Ohio, and uh, actually co-founded a, a life sciences company. So I had no science background. I was a finance major with an entrepreneurship minor. Um, so during my senior year, uh, I actually helped start a company, which was great. It was really interesting, and um, I did that shortly after my senior year. Uh, you know, after leaving the company, there was a gentleman, Matthew Berkeley, who was the chief strategy officer at Thompson Financial, who I'd done an internship with. And uh, I said, Matthew, you know, is there an opportunity to come out to New York City? And he said, absolutely. So, um, you know, if you looked at Thompson Financial, the strategy group, it was really run like an internal management consultancy. So I had to work on M&A, new product development, um, you know, reorganizations of our sales force. So I really learned the financial information business really quickly under him, and it was a great experience. And two of the strategies that were really instrumental in my development, one was Thompson Financial News. So if you looked at Thompson, Bloomberg, and Reuters at the time, we were the only big, you know, one of the big three that didn't have our own news capability. So we, needed, we, we knew news was always on the top of our customers' requirements in terms of content. 
So, uh, you know, I had the pleasure and the, and the honor of working on that strategy with Matthew. And, you know, we bought a company in Europe. We actually built out a flash desk in New York, which was very cool. Um, and then the other strategy that I got to, to work quite a bit on was algorithmic trading and really understanding quantitative traders, algorithmic traders. And, uh, you know, we started seeing an opportunity to take our news and deliver it in a very different way. Um, so, Thompson bought Reuters, which was an interesting time. And, um, you know, some of the, the early work that I did on market maps and, you know, where we were strong and where Reuters was strong, uh, you know, I learned down the road were used in kind of the board level discussions of, of uh, justifying that acquisition, which was kind of cool. Um, so Thompson bought Reuters, and I think, um, you know, they were very eager for me to, to work on a new part of the organization that had nothing to do with the news and events. Uh, and I was very passionate about that space, and, that, you know, I wanted to continue to see a product that I had built, because taking a step back, if you look at, I was in a strategy role, but I'd pitched to the senior manager of the organization uh, that I should build, you know, this machine-readable news product. And Sharon Rollins, our CEO, CEO at the time, agreed, so I moved from a strategy role into an operational role. And that was really important for me because I wanted to prove to myself that I could actually take that strategy document. Because if, uh, if you ever work in strategy, your job typically start, you know, stops with a PowerPoint that you give to someone else to actually execute. I wanted to prove to myself that I could take that piece of paper, turn it into something that's tangible and actually sell that product in the market. And we did that, uh, which was great. And it was a lot of fun to actually manage a team and build out a product and do the first sales. So after proving myself that I could do that, you know, I really was always keen on being an entrepreneur and starting my own company. Um, so I had a, a tremendous experience at Thompson, but decided to leave because uh, a company was being put up for sale. So a friend who was in private equity said, you know, Ryan, I've come across this news asset. It's, you know, uh, you know up for sale. Would you want to get involved? So I didn't feel comfortable. Uh, you know, being at Thompson, getting involved in this process, so I actually had quit my job and um, started lining up investment to, to actually buy this news asset and, and turn it into more of a technology-centric news company. Uh, we looked at the asset, we decided to pass, so I was left without a job. Uh, I had investors though, and I said, you know, let's start uh, a search company that can, you know, uh, detect events out in the world through, un you know, using search technology to go across unstructured sources. And then once we detect these events, let's be able to deliver those in a unique way that allows, you know, not only human traders, but electronic traders to take advantage of that. So, you know, that's how Solarity started, and that was uh, really my background uh, and, and kind of how I got to where I'm today. And Solarity, tell me exactly what the product is. What do you have? So, we built a search product uh, that, can go, that can go across unstructured sources like a, a press release or a website. Uh, we, actually, we actually even have a, an individual who submits uh, you know, things through email from Australia. And um, we use our technology to detect important events to financial professionals. So it might be uh, an earnings release, it might be a macroeconomic statistic, it could be a geopolitical event. And once we detect that uh, event, we're pulling out fact-based information that our customers would want to use in their models. So you can think of it almost as a monitoring platform. Uh, almost kind of Google alerts on steroids, uh, you know, for a different segment of the market. Um, so that's really kind of what Celerity is today. But do, you, do you use social media too, or just the traditional media? You know, we've stuck to primary authoritative sources. We are looking at social media. We actually have some infrastructure that allows us to see, you know, when individuals and, and companies are releasing their information to see if it's timely. Uh, part of our value proposition is, you know, definitely real time and low latency. So we sit at this convergence convergence between real-time search and low latency market data networks. So our, either our engineers came out of the real-time search community or they came out of building real-time and low latency trading systems. So we know how to move data around very, very quickly and uh, you know the scales at which we talk about are kind of microsecond and millisecond, which is pretty amazing because on the other side you actually have machines taking advantage of this information instead of a human looking at a terminal reacting to it. Um, so um, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Instead of B2B, it's machine to machine. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's really interesting. I think we'll, we'll get a few questions. So a long way from my uh, days of my It is. It's, it's great. First Good for you. And you've been on a plane a few times now. I have been on a plane. Peter, why don't you tell us about your... Sure. And should we go in sort of reverse chronological order from uh, the present day? Is that yeah. Good? Okay. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Peter Lehrman. Uh, uh, I started a company after grad school called Axial Market. Uh, we're based here in New York. 
the company uh, is a platform for deal professionals. We define deal professionals as essentially any uh, investment professional, investment banker, corporate development officer, or other professional who's actively engaged in buying, investing in, advising, or lending to privately held companies. And our, I would say that our aspiration in many ways is to be something along the lines of a Bloomberg terminal for the private markets. Uh, if you think about Bloomberg terminals as the sort of dominant platform for traders of public, public securities, we're building a platform that allows the deal professional who's managing an asset sale, managing a sell side M&A process, we're building a platform that helps them identify most likely acquirers, the most likely investors, gives them a, both a network to tap into as well as a lot of data, a lot of rich data on who are the companies and who are the potential uh, prospects that they should be speaking with. Sometimes that's a really simple process, a really obvious process. Um, you know, there's, uh, particularly when the companies are really large, um, but what we've really focused on is this category of companies that are bootstrapped, typically, um, and smaller in scale than what you read about in the newspaper. So, you know, I think if uh, it's safe to say that if Oracle buys some microsystems, that's not, you know, that's, that's not a transaction that, at least, that we were, you know, a platform supporting. But when uh, you're talking about companies that have anywhere between five million and a couple hundred million dollars in, in revenue, talking about a much smaller group of companies, much more diverse and fragmented base of potential investors or lenders or buyers, and the absence of a single common platform to support both sides of that transaction leads to a lot of missed opportunities uh, for, for both the financiers and the, and the corporations as well as missed opportunities for entrepreneurs looking to exit their, their business successfully or, or finance their business successfully. So. That's, the, that's what the business does. It's a combination of a network that you can connect with these counterparties as well as a, uh, a data platform so that you can learn about all of these other counterparties that are in your market. Um, and the, the history of it is um, certainly multifaceted. What I can say is just sort of going back in reverse chronological order. I was uh, in graduate school at Stanford and uh, in between years and while I was uh, getting my, uh, my degree, I was working part-time for a private equity firm and the private equity firm was focusing on acquiring instrument businesses, primarily test and, and measurement instrument businesses. And uh, that niche is incredibly diverse and is very, very poorly covered, particularly since test and measurement businesses are, not a lot of people even know what they are, and, and they're in all these different sort of end markets and end categories. And so, and I had no investment banking experience prior to working at this company, so I had none of the sort of traditional skill sets to offer this private equity firm. Frankly, I don't really know why they, they, they let me enter there. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the fact that I didn't really have any of those skills made me feel like the only way that I could really add value was to try and work on building a pipeline for them of, of opportunities, because I couldn't do a lot of the financial modeling and quantitative analysis that uh, bankers tend to do when they move into the private equity stage of their careers. Uh, and I come from a, a company where a lot of what I did was uh, think about building systems to manage very, very large pipelines of either data or customers or leads. Um, and so I began looking at identifying target companies for this private equity firm, basically as a traditional sales funnel. And I saw all these sort of challenges and problems associated with doing it. Uh, we really only had just our email uh, application and our Microsoft Excel spreadsheets as sort of the way that we managed and stored data and thought about who we were going to reach out to. And so uh, it became very clear to me that there was no there was no systematic process by which this happened. And, it, and, and as a result, a lot of these private deals got, you know, they get done through happenstance, through serendipity. They get done because people are in the right place at the right time. They get done because you're, you know, both members of the same golf club. And um, that's not you know, that's not a good modern solution for private entrepreneurship. Um, that there's, we could do a better job than that, essentially was my conclusion. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's really the genesis of the business idea. Um, and before that, just briefly, uh, I worked uh, at Gerson Lehrman Group. Gerson Lehrman Group was started in uh, 1999, reinvented in 2001. 
uh, after the, the first idea was was completely uh, off off the mark. And uh, it was started by my brother Thomas and, and Mark Gerson as a publishing company. Uh, I was there as an intern. I was still in college at the time, and you know we produced these these products, and no one wanted them, and uh, we were you know running, <laughs> running out of money uh, in a hurry. And so we switched the business in 2000, 2001 to the business model that some of you may be familiar with today, which is a distributed global uh, platform for experts to connect with corporations and hedge funds and other people who need expertise really quickly. And uh, so I, I joined there very fresh out of college. There were a few people at the company when I was there, and uh, that experience certainly made it clear to me that, uh, you know, uh, Entrepreneurship can be really rewarding, very exciting, um, uh, very profitable. Uh, so uh, I took a couple years off, went to grad school, and uh, then went back to work. Great. We take back for a sec. So uh, Todd may have one, one of the more uh, colorful sort of <laughs> backgrounds of, the, of all of us. Um, but Todd's uh, uh, really been a, an inspiration to me to watch a you know a, an entrepreneur who sticks through it. And like you've heard a couple times already on here, uh, you got to learn when you're in the when you're in the business of starting a business that you have to be able to turn on a dime. Things got to, things change. They change on you. They change to you, uh, and you have to react to them very quickly. It's one of the reasons very few entrepreneurial ventures do well inside traditional companies where planning is much more uh, of, of the name of the game. But. I mean, I think Todd can talk a little bit about uh, about uh, the fast-moving world of uh, hedge funds and where it came from, and and uh, I don't think things slowed down when you started your business, did they? No, and uh, I'm a bit of an accidental entrepreneur. I, I want to ask first, how many people in this room uh, actually went to MIT? Okay, because it's a very intimidating school. I don't know, I mean, I'm sitting up here talking to you, and you went to MIT, and I went to Syracuse, and we have a better basketball team, but you're in terms of smarter than me. So, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I don't know but you were better at betting on basketball. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't know if this was like uh, youngest to oldest, or you know, was well planned, but uh, and, you know, colorful is one way uh, to look at it. Um, you know. And, and, I'll, I'll start, I'm going to start at the beginning, just as a contrarian, uh, I will start at the beginning rather than uh, uh, the, the, and, and try to keep it quick, uh, as with any uh, narcissist, I could talk about myself all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in all seriousness, I apologize, it's been a long day, uh, as it was, but, you know, I grew up, uh, and it's funny, I, the first person I walked in, I saw today was my brother's best friend growing up in Great Neck, who I have not seen in over 35 years, uh, he's like, recognize me? <laughs> it's like, I haven't seen you since I've been eight. Uh, you know, uh, but it's an interesting kickoff to the story because you know I grew up in a town that had a lot of money and I did not have a lot of money. And um, I was programmed to believe as a child that if you want to make money, you have to stand near the ca cash register. And uh, basically spent the better part of my entire life um, trying to make money uh, and thinking that money was success and thinking that money was validation and thinking that money was, uh, you know, to... Uh, to borrow a phrase from Run DMC, the, the key to end all your woes. Um, and uh, chased it through college, went to Syracuse, uh, as I said, um, ended up uh, somehow, some way. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I was accused of cheating on my finance midterm, and, uh, and the professor called me in to grill me, and it turns out that I didn't cheat. Uh, I liked finance and, uh, and placed me into a class, uh, an MBA honors program uh, in, uh, in London, and he listed all these companies I could work for. Uh, I heard Morgan Stanley, I, didn't, I just knew they were the best, or among the best, and I, that's where the money was uh, at the time. And I said, well, if you put me in Morgan Stanley, I'll, I'll go over there. And it turned out to be the only paying internship, which was awesome uh, you know, for a kid who was paying his way through school. And uh, long story short, came home, uh, and I networked and uh, a little bit, and I was uh, in happenstance. You know, it's a bit of luck for any endeavor to succeed. And, uh, it turns out the, the, the gentleman who started the equity derivative business <clears throat> at Morgan Stanley uh, was a friend of my cousin's who uh, happened to be in a town next to the girlfriend I was visiting. I mean, it was that kind of weird. Uh, and uh, and he, he went back to Syracuse for my senior year, got a call, 
uh, in, uh, in uh, right as I was getting ready to go to a toga party, uh, and, uh, and he said, you know, yeah, in his high pitched voice, the high education. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very expensive toga party at Syracuse University. Uh, but you know, in his high pitched voice, he said, can, can you start on Monday? And I heard a lot of noise in the background, and I was like, wow, you know, this sounds really exciting. And I, from my time in Morgan Stanley, like I was a, the the guy who used to take the the, the orders, the, the the trade breaks, the errors to the traders, and I'd walk over there, I was a big guy at the time, I was like 215, I'm now more than 215, but a different allocation of weight. Um, and I'd walk up and I'd tell these traders that they made a mistake and they would just verbally abuse me and kick the living crap out of me and I was like, this place is awesome. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, that's what I wanted to be. Like, I finally figured out what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to be the guy who yelled at people. And, you know, <laughs> you know, I, Very like, similar yeah, to Pledge of Eternity. Were, <laughs> they wore the nicest suits, and they, you know, they had the shoes shine when I work. I'm like, this is awesome. And uh, you know, sure enough, I got the, you know, I, I ended up uh, working at Morgan Stanley on the equity derivative desk when I was still hungover from graduation, and uh, and I didn't know anything. You know, when I went to my college professors and I wanted to learn about finance, they told me to read the Wall Street Journal and. And, and, and study a Black Scholes model, and I was like, okay, you know. And I started on Morgan Stanley Equity Derivatives Desk. I'm 21 years old, and, and I mean, you th I thought London was cool. Like this place was awesome. It was like right down the street, 1251 Avenue, the Americas. I was walking by there. I'm like, ah, I remember that place. And uh, you know, when I think the first couple of years, I, I didn't, I didn't get fired because nobody wanted to take the extra five minutes at the end of the day to fire me. I was, <laughs> I was so clueless. I was giving markets. <laughs> Three, uh, five H three eighths, you know, IBM symbol IBM. I mean, I was like, it was, it was. In hindsight, it was funny. It, it, the truth is, like, I made a mean salad, uh, and I used to make salads for the traders, and then like, I would drizzle the balsamic. And, like, it was like, and I, I did that. I chased the cash register. I'm sorry, I told you I, I could talk. I, I, I chased the cash register. I was, you know, ended up somehow finding a mentor, and I. Ended up being a decent trader, as it turned out, uh, and I, uh, you know, got promoted. And I was 26, I think, at the time, the youngest vice president at Morgan Stanley, which was like the badge of honor. Like my business card was my favorite thing. I'm like, now I'm like here. Like I made 28,000 my first year, 28,000 my second year, 75,000 my third year. I'm like, yeah, I'm like 24 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, 150,000 a year after. I'm like, this is awesome. It doesn't stop. It just keeps growing. This money tree. Uh, and and then I got promoted, and I realized that everybody around me thought I all of a sudden was an asshole because I got promoted, and they didn't get promoted. And now it wasn't funny when I came in drunk on Mondays; I was being irresponsible, and it was my first taste of corporate politics at Morgan Stanley. And I ended up moving over to a small hedge fund, uh, some of you might know, called Galleon. Um, yeah, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, learned a lot. I told you this was going to be color. Yeah. And, and you know, wouldn't you know, I ran a retired derivative thing, and these guys were making hundreds of millions. All of a sudden, that money at Morgan Stanley seemed like, you know, pennies. And uh, and they're like, you know, bonus time, they're like, nope, next year, nope. And I'm like, you know, and then they're like, finally sat me down, you don't have what it takes to be a partner here. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, best thing that never happened to me, I thought, <laughs> you know, like, now I look back, I'm like, thank God, you know, it was like, I would have had to roll a three-sided dice, like I'd be dead, a billionaire, or in jail. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's not a dice I'll roll. I'm sorry, I'll give you the mic in a second, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Interesting. laughs> so, so <laughs> it, gets, it gets crazier, as you know. So, okay, we're not I, at the good part yet. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it turns out, I, I, I turn around and, uh, and, and I didn't make partner, and I'm crushed, and it's like, you know, he was this close, and... Uh, and then I got a call from my buddy who I, who I had been talking to. His name was Jeff Berkowitz. He was Jim Kramer's partner at Kramer Berkowitz. And I didn't know Jim. You know, I, all I knew was that he used to call at, seven, at 6.30 in the morning. I was the first guy to get He's like, hey, 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 hey. Like he does on TV every day. But he was actually, every day at 6.30, the light would ring. And I was the only one at the desk. And I would pick it up. And you're like, what do you think today? I'm like, I like him. You know, he's like, me too, me too. You know, it, 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 I ended up going to Kramer Berkowitz. I'm condensing the back half of the story. And one day he asked me to write a column for thestreet.com. He was going on vacation in July of 2000. And I had never written it. I, mean, I used to write letters to my mom in the camp, you know, when I had to. Uh, and uh, I said, sure, I'll, you know, because Jim, if anybody knows Jim, once he gets an idea in his head, it's like, you know, ripping a, a T bone from a pit bull. Like, it's just not going to happen. So I'm like, sure, Jim. And I 
I had fun with it. I wrote Grateful Dead lyrics, double entendres, Uncle Buck references. I just had fun. It was a, it was a lark for me. And uh, I happened to be very bearish on technology. It was the spring of 2000. And uh, next thing I know, I see Jim, and he's he wrapping me in a bear hug. He's like, you gotta write, you gotta write a column, and you write a column. And I'm writing a column, sitting as far as I am from Larry, writing a column next to Jim, who is completely different than, than I am in terms of trading and how we approach the markets. And here I was, finally, I'm 30 years old, and I'm like, the, I'm head trader at a $400 million hedge fund, and I'm, you know, I'm on track to be the president of Kramer Berkowitz, which, which I was the next year. And I'm like, finally, like I finally got the cash register. I finally got the money. I finally got everything that I've been trying to get for my entire life. And I realized, you know, I realized that it wasn't what I thought it would be. I realized that there's a difference between having fun and, and being happy. Uh, I never really stopped to think about that, uh, you know, until, you know, my grandfather was dying, and I won't really get into that, but I got letters from people who I'd never seen, who never met, and we used to print those letters out, and I'd read them to my grandfather on his deathbed week after week after week, and I was like, wow, there's something to this worldwide interweb thing, you know? These people, like, I've never met before writing me emails, and this is really cool, and, um, but I'm like, I'm gonna still make money, because that's, that's more fun. And, uh, you know, a couple months later, after my grandfather passed, uh, you know, plain, God, the weirdest thing, plane flew into the World Trade Center uh, right down the street from my office. And I remember just standing there watching with my mouth open as people were holding hands and jumping off of the top of the World Trade Center. And the second plane hit, and, and honestly, the next couple of years, it was, a, it was a blur and some sort of PTSD, depression kind of phase of my life that I don't really remember. But I do know that I realized I'm not happy. <laughs> I realized I was having fun. I was dating a lot of very pretty girls, which was fun. Um, I was driving a lot of really nice cars, which was fun, but I wasn't happy. So I decided that I wanted to do something different. So um, I decided I was going to start this thing called Minionville, because when I started writing for the website, I said, you know, for those of you who've ever seen Animal House, there's the, the, the scene with, with Lawrence, and he's got the Dean's daughter, and he's got the little angel and the little devil. So that little angel and little devil was the Bull Wall Street bull and bear. And I used them as metaphorical representations of my thought process. Hoofy the bull and boo the bear. I mean, this is after 60 dead shows, so you can use your imagination that this is probably a little bit creative. And sure enough, people are like, hey, does Hoofy see IBM breaking out? And, and does Boo see this breaking down? And, and this was all before 9-11. After 9-11, I'm like, I'm going to go create a... Uh, a, a platform, a universe for these guys to live, and it's going to be void of the acrimony, the political pain, all the nonsense that, that goes on in the world. And uh, I just <coughs> left everything. I left the hedge fund I, as president of a $400 million hedge fund. Uh, I started a children's foundation in, in my grandfather's honor, which is the, still to this day the thing I'm most proud of. And, uh, you know, I went out and I put all my money into. <laughs> this place called Minionville, uh, with the idea that there's metaphorical characters and there's a, 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 a thorn a quorum for thought. And uh, it was, uh, you know, I was telling you uh, before, the, before the thing, you know, after about $2 million, I kind of looked at this thing and go, holy shit, if I don't figure out a business model, this is the, this is the stupidest hobby that I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> And, uh, and that was uh, then, and uh, over the years, as Larry said, we've had to change, we've had to build, we've had to adapt. Uh, it's now a global community. We're right in 229 countries and territories. We have four divisions. Uh, we have .com, uh, which again is changing faster than you could say Twitter. Uh, we have a products division where we license our content behind the firewall at TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, uh, and others of that ilk. Uh, so that's license and subscriptions. Uh, we have a studio division where Hoofy and Boo, <coughs> my uh, metaphorical friends, uh, won an Emmy Award in 2008. It was a Sally Field moment, don't need to get into that. And, and then we have a gaming division to teach children <coughs> earning, spending, saving, and giving. And, uh, you know, it's a very rewarding, different type of P&L. Uh, it's a lot of psychic income, a lot of uh, personal human dividends. And, uh, you know, I've always said if you can do what you love with people you respect while serving the greater good, then you'll never work a day in your life. Uh, and I try to tell that to my fiance when the bills come, but she's still trying to figure out whether I'm full of shit or not, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Philippe, this is, a, this is a lot like uh, um, 
uh, execution management systems, right? Yeah. Uh, which, which is where you are. And, and Felipe, as I said before, he's the he really comes from probably the most sophisticated of the of the business worlds that we're in, uh, and highly technology oriented. And I think you part of your story about New York is about doing this in New York is a good story about um, talent becoming available and, and things like that. And, why this is why timing is good in New York for businesses like this. So, why don't you talk a little bit about how you got into that? Sure. Uh, starting in, in River Soldier, um, well, the first time I came on my own to the US was in California. I completely fall, fell in love with California. That's why I'm here today, I guess. Um, and I swear to myself it would work there. And I never did, except <laughs> during the summer. Um, but I worked there for a year and a half in total, in fact, through various internships. And, uh, and it allowed me to discover a lot of things, you know, and once in my first job I got recruited, honestly, because I knew what the microprocessor was, which was an interesting concept at the time. Um, and being from a family of engineers, you know, everyone you know, in my family, so uh, there was always a computer being fixed somewhere, and Sinclair, and Windows 64, I, yeah. my, 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 my poor mother was pretty uh, busy with four kids. Um, and so we, we have this tradition, and so when I started my first job, uh, I kind of, I didn't like, for instance, to calculate, you know, uh, financial ratios. I had to do that as a banker to my first job. And uh, I devised this absolutely crazy system based on a prime and a minitel. I don't know if people remember what it is, but anyway, it was calculating the ratio automatically and people felt it was a miracle. <laughs> and um, so, you yeah, know, I said, I'm not so bad at that. So, and then my next job, I moved on, I came here, uh, and anyway, you, I learned a lot about what I know in finance. And after that, I hesitated between Bankers Trust and you know, consulting at Buzalan. And finally, I decided to go to the corporate world. So I became a, a treasurer at Dow Chemical in Europe. Learned a lot there. Great school, great management skills, uh, in a very impressive company. And then uh, it was 1987, and uh, people asked me to, to run the, the certain dealing room of a big French bank. And I found that fairly interested, so I decided to do that. It was the right time, right? 87. Um, everybody <laughs> told me I was totally nuts. Uh, and, but it allowed me to discover the first revolution I, 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 I faced, which was the, um, the derivatives revolution, which was really amazing. Uh, a bit like the, the technology revolution. I always say I've, I've been very lucky to live through two revolutions the derivatives revolution and the British technology revolution in, the, in finance. And so, anyway, so I did that, I did that very successfully. And the same thing, I developed risk systems and all type of systems because I had to. We had nothing. So, we wanted to know what was our exposure on Citibank. At the time, you didn't want to lend to Citibank. Um, it's funny, it doesn't change that much. But anyway, um, <laughs> and uh, we moved on like that. I built a number of systems there with my team. Uh, but I was really fundamentally a business guy. I was really buying and selling stuff, uh, foreign exchange bonds, and, and so on. Then I moved on and I uh, discovered the listed derivative business coming to the US for um, uh, FEMAT, a large broker, which I run. I opened Brazil, Canada, did a lot of things there. Very interested, I understand, I understood a lot about clearing and built a lot of clearing stuff, a lot of clearing system. In fact, the first clearing system uh, called uh, at the time Finasis. And um, moved on, went to Credit Suisse, and there they asked me to rebuild the um, listed derivative franchise. and. Uh, Electronic trading didn't exist. You had only two electronic markets at the time. It was uh, Japan and Europe and Germany, and they were not doing very well. And, but I really, I really liked it. And uh, I found a great partner who helped me to create my uh, current company. It was a, an IT guy, and uh, one day he gave me a demo, and I, I can swear, you know, I was pressing a, he was based in Tokyo, by the way, so I was pressing a button to get the execution. It was like taking seven minutes. I mean, it was really an impressive system. Uh, but I saw the power of it. And I really loved it. I, I, they were, the team was fired, so I went to my boss and I said, we can fire these guys. So I took them in my team. And I, uh, that became the nucleus of a, well, honestly, a lot of the electronic trading system at Credit Suisse, which is what you do today. A uh, lot of the other side on the rest. And, uh, and at one point, uh, it became so big. Uh, at the time, the business model in Wall Street was really messed up on this derivative. You couldn't make money. It was all people driven, and uh, you were paying a guy 50% of the commission. Your cost was 48%, so you were left, left with 2%. And if you had one mistake in the year, you were wiped out. So I transformed, on this, and we were the first system to do that, uh, called Prime Trade. We transformed the 48% of cost in 3%. We kept charging the high commission <laughs> to, to make sure. So we made so much money 
people shouldn't believe it because we have no risk, we are not using any capital, it was totally transactional, it was infinitely scalable, and all the markets were moving electronically. And uh, at that time, suddenly everybody was very interested in my business, and I started to spend, like uh, what you were mentioning, 50% of my time just fighting the flow, and not doing anything interesting, and I said, I can't stand it anymore. And so I went from being a very uh, well-paid executive to be a very low-paid entrepreneur. <laughs> so, <coughs> uh, which it's going around, which was uh, really fun. We started in a garage covered with graffiti in uh, in Bleecker Street, and um, it was uh, you know I got fined because I was depositing garbage in the street and I was a company um, <laughs> at night. Um, so I had a lot of good experience, but a fantastic team. Uh, first and foremost, a fantastic team, and. Uh, the concept we had was very simple. Um, I was very involved with the buy side, and I saw right away that uh, they were trading with, honestly, the phone, uh, at best, to Bloomberg. And on the other side, I have built these incredibly sophisticated screens for my traders, and I said, this is not fair. <laughs> there was really a weapon competition going on, and so I supplied the weapon to the right side, um, which happened to be the buy side. So. Uh, we reestablish a lot of the balance by creating what is called the first execution management system. So um, it's it's mostly uh, either a plug, a fixed plug, uh, an API, or it's kind of like being an orange dealer, though. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, <laughs> it's good you sell to both sides. Um, so fundamentally, what we are is a huge community. We have on one side, uh, I don't even know how many banks. We have every bank is connected to our system. Every bank, anywhere, really. Uh, and on the buy side, we have 1,600 buy sides, large buy sides. We don't do small ones because our system is more targeted towards the fairly large uh, players. And um, I, I, I have the chance in my life to trade the four asset classes, which is very rare in Wall Street. And so uh, we build it right away uh, for the asset class to be just a reference in the database. And we uh, build all the trading models, streaming all the gold basket, whatever you, you can think of, RFQ. And so we can very easily um, uh, take this chair and make it a product and trade it. And that's what we really brought <laughs> as a, there is maybe money. Um, what, one of the things which we did, I think, is we took a, 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 a usual traditional implementation time, which was between six months and a year, and we transformed it in, in, in an hour. And that's really fundamental, the value added of the system at the time. Now the people do it, you see? But uh, at the time it was, Really a breakthrough, and since then we have uh, we have grown a lot. Obviously, we're everywhere in the world. We have a lot of clients in China, a lot of clients in Brazil, a lot of clients everywhere. It's, it's an amazing little company. Uh, we are 200 people, completely scattered, scattered but, uh, you know, across the world. And uh, now we have been extending to the back end on SPMS, so also on a on a cloud basis, service you know, the software as a service basis. And we, more recently, we developed exchanges. So we, uh, we created uh, uh, an exchange for bonds, corporate bonds, in Europe. And we are expanding on the, on the platform business. So we are trying to keep our focus on core technologies, which are complementized, and we can even lend to someone else. Uh, but we, uh, we try to focus on what we do best, which is the financial world. And it's very, very simple. Great. Uh, so my story is probably closer to Todd's than yeah, the, the, the Grateful Dead part. The Grateful Dead part. Uh, I was a very reluctant uh, entrepreneur. I, 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 all I wanted to be was a newspaper man. I grew up in New Jersey right outside here in Bergen County. I was delivered the Bergen Record. That was the beginning of my newspaper career, I thought, which I thought would never end. Uh, and I went to Syracuse, uh, had some of the very similar flashback moments that, that Todd's had, um, and, and had a great time. I was editor of the paper up there. and. Uh, when I graduated, I went to Harvard Business School uh, because I wanted to cover business. This was the early 70s, and the, the basic uh, mantra was follow the money, and for different reasons, and everybody here followed the money. We were looking, doing investigative reporting. It was Watergate. It was all during that period of time. And, uh, and uh, Harvard uh, was probably the only business school that would have taken me because it was such a, just a bizarre application. I didn't have a single business course in my uh, undergraduate years. Um, and I told them I wanted to write about business, and they said, well, that's interesting. They didn't really have any way to gauge if I was any good at it or not, so they just took me. <laughs> um, and, and they both basically told me later that they take about 5% of the incoming class uh, as what they call poets, whose job it is to liven up classroom discussion. <laughs> because uh, a big part of your grade is classroom discussion up there. You know? And I learned also there that there are no right or wrong answers. That the, the best grades at Harvard Business School 
frequently could be from people who took entirely opposite positions on the same uh, case, which was fascinating to me and, and quite interesting. Anyway, I left Harvard Business School and I was a report. I did what I said I was going to do. Became a reporter at the San Francisco Examiner. I got hired away by by the then the the place that everybody wanted to be, the Washington Post in the 70s. Um, and I was at the Post. Uh, I was a reporter for a few years. They made me an editor for the first time, um, and I became ultimately became assistant managing editor of the Washington Post and uh, ran Metro coverage. And then I my original newspaper, where I had been for the first my first job, San Francisco Examiner, came back to me and said, "We'd like you to come back." And I was 35, and they wanted me to be editor in chief. And so that was the dream. My dream was to be a metropolitan newspaper editor. That's that was it. That was I, all I ever wanted out of life. I got to San Francisco, we bought this fantastic house in Tiburon, my son was about three and my daughter was just, uh, wasn't born yet, she was born the next year. And things were going great, and we ran about five years into that, and the time I turned 40 in 1990, uh, the, uh, we had a newspaper um, recession, a you know, media recession, um, and that was brutal. And all the things we had done, I opened up the bureaus, we'd won our Pulitzers, we had done, we had done great stuff, worldwide coverage. Uh, we had to scale it all back, I had to close the bureaus, I had to lay off a quarter of the staff. And I was depressed, I mean, not clinically depressed, but I was pretty depressed about my life and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, So I, I negotiated my own buyout and I said I need to go. And the Hearst people were terrific, it was a Hearst newspaper. And they basically bought me a year. They said, we'll pay, take a year off on us. And if you want to come back, we'll find a job for you. They, they had to fill the job I was in. Um, and uh, so it was, it was something I really needed because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I had this incredibly vivid memory of uh, about midway through that year, sitting on the, on the um, deck of our house in Tiburon, great view of San Francisco and the Bay, and uh, looking out with my family. My daughter was, I think, was about five at the time. My son was nine. <coughs> And my wife and I'm telling him, look, I, I have three choices here. I could, if I want to stay in the newspaper business, I, we have to move. I've got an offer in New York. Um, I had an offer from uh, CNN, which was trying to get heavily into news then. Tom Johnson, who was a newspaper publisher on the West Coast, had taken over CNN. And uh, they asked me to come as a news editor. Uh, and that looked pretty promising. And the third possibility was to stay in San Francisco and become an entrepreneur. A friend of mine wanted to start a business. And he had some he had some tracks into it. He really, but he, he was it was and it, it was involved things I liked, but I didn't know anything about being an entrepreneur. And uh, my wife said, well, prior to this little session on our deck, had said to me, look, why don't you talk to your friends, all your friends here in Tiburon? And Tiburon's this, I mean, beautiful place in Marin County, it, a really a, a high end community. I said all of your friends are entrepreneurs, you know, that you're as smart as they are. This is easy. I said, you know, why not? 95% of you know entrepreneurs fail. You know the other five percent live in Tiburon. This is, not, this is not like a sure thing. It's like okay, let's just do that. You know, it, it's not that easy. We could be you know in a two-story walk-up in Richmond in six months. And uh, and uh, you know she said, no, no, that's not going to happen to you. You know, you're fine. you're as smart as these guys. And I went and talked to all these guys, and I said, what does it take? And could I really do this? And and I learned from them, they all said the same thing. They all said, you're smart enough, all that street. It's all about one thing if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, it's about your gut. You have to be able to gut it out. You have to be able to ride a roller coaster and have every deal you're gonna do go up and down seven times. And you have to believe enormously in yourself, and you do, and that was a polite way of saying it. And you have to believe that uh, you know, you're gonna outlast whatever comes in, in your way, because lots of things come in your way. And that's, that's the magic. If you can do that, if you can gut it out, you, and if you can bounce off of every failure and learn from it, you'll be a successful entrepreneur. So I had this, we culminated in this meeting with our family and on the balcony, and I said, okay, you guys, what do you think? Um, New York, Atlanta, or we take a chance and we stay here? And uh, my five-year-old daughter said, Dad, if you need to caucus, could you get off the balcony, get off the deck? And I said, Okay, uh, so I went off, I went in the kitchen, you know, got a Coke. Uh, I got called back out seven minutes later, I timed it. And uh, they said, okay, we, we think you should do, take the job that you think is the right one for you. You should do whatever you think is right for you, and, and if it's New York or Atlanta, we'll see you on weekends. <laughs> I said, okay, uh, subtle as always, my family. 
Um, so I, I became an entrepreneur, and um, and I did. I started a precursor to. This was 1990, so there was no real internet at the time. It was a sports, a handheld sports device, which gave you sports information, and it was. The company that my friend worked at, which actually was our biggest, I had to go out and raise money, but they contributed money and they housed us, was a company called Data Broadcasting. They had a, a, a device called Quotrek. It was the only handheld device you'd get real-time quotes on at the time. It was huge. It looked like those early brick phones. But it was transmitted over FM sideband. I mean, there was no internet, so it was an embedded signal in an FM radio signal, and the data was received on this machine. And but they were only they had this radio network around the country, radio stations in every city, but they didn't, and they were using it nine to five Monday to Friday for the market. So you could put your stocks in, and they update in real time. And uh, and, and my buddy was their marketing director, and he's a VP, and he said, you know, we're not using it nights and weekends. What other data could we put on this network? We have it. And they decided maybe sports, and that which was a big interest of mine. I was editor of an afternoon paper. We did a lot of sports at the time, and um, so we built this thing called Sport Tracks. And, uh, it, and the last thing I did before, and this was a real lesson I learned from the from the financial guys. Everybody loved having uh, a, a device that had all their stocks in real time, but the only people who would really pay for it were people who were trading heavily. Who had a stake? Who could, you know, they could justify. It was a couple hundred a month because the you had uh, um, you had uh, fees from all the um, um, uh, exchanges that that that, that whose real time data was expensive. But the alternative was a two thousand dollar terminal, two thousand dollar a month terminal. So if you were a day trader, day traders were just starting that. This was your chance to have real time data, and. So everybody loved having them, but the only people who would pay for it are people who really traded. And I worried about the sports one because everybody loved the sports one, even though we were only going to charge 49 a month or some, you know, we had to buy the feeds and do all that stuff too. It was still going to be, I was worried about it. So I went and got, at the last minute, I went to Vegas, and I got the guy who did opening odds for all the casinos to put live odds on the machine. And I went to every casino and asked for their odds because every casino moves the odds. Uh, depending on the betting at their casino. It could, you could actually have different odds on the same game in different places. They're close, but, they're, but frequently, it, their job at the casino is to have half the betting on each side of the game. They don't want any risk. And they want to pay, they want to fight very different, very similar to the financial markets and arbitrage and stuff. And these guys said, uh, they all were, they didn't want to give me their data. They said, you know, we don't, they don't even let people with cell phones sit in sports books. And I said to them, they were being middled a lot and it was uh, without going into too much detail here, financially the bad guys were middling the houses because they know what the odds were in each game. They had people watching the odds at each game, calling it central place. I said, I can give you a computer as part of the deal that sits behind your sports book that will show you the live odds at each of your each of the casinos. So you'll know if the odds are moving somewhere else faster than the bad guys. And they liked that. And uh, so that was what inspired them to give me the data. So I put the data on my sport tracks. And sure enough, you know, we, the, everybody loved the product. We gave you two months free. Every, th hundreds of people, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people took it on because for the first two months for free. But when it came time to keeping it, it was, it was like a five, ten percent because the only people who keep it are people who bet heavily. And, and the people who bet heavily really wanted those odds because they could be the, they could see the odds ahead of their bookies. And they could they could understand when to make that bet better, and, play, and it was a, it was science to them. We had to so every bookie and every heavy better in the country bought this thing. Uh, Data broadcasting, which handled it for us and handled all the customer service, had to add a cancellation code called "seized by law enforcement authorities," <laughs> <laughs> because every time a bookmaking operation was raided, there'd be five of our devices sitting in there. I mean, it was a mail order. It, I, I, one lesson I'll tell you is we started the whole thing with partnerships because we had no money. One of the partnerships was Sporting News. They agreed to put their name on the device and they marketed it for us. And they got a percentage of the revenue. Data Broadcasting did everything for us. They built the products, did it all for a percentage. Everybody was getting a variable number from us. And so we didn't have to put up a lot of cash in the beginning and that's how we did it. Even with that, we managed to run out of cash in two years. <laughs> and, they st and they wound up buying the company. It was still worth a lot to them because it was incremental revenue for them. More importantly, they asked me when they bought Market Watch, when they bought Data Sport, if I would help them with their financial business because now it was 92, 93, and they were starting to hear about the internet. 
and they were worried that financial that their monopoly on at home traders on, on basically uh, uh, self-directed traders they were worried that that might go away somebody else might be able to come with a cheaper product with a cheap product and I said and they asked me how we could fight that and I said well if, it, if you're only selling real-time data it's all about price if somebody can deliver it cheaper you're dead and so my advice was to do the only thing I knew how to do which was build a newsroom and add news to it and and so if people leave you they're going to be leaving your news too I mean, that was a value add that we couldn't, and that the really big guys, Bloomberg, Reuters, Dow, Dow Jones, couldn't come down to this price point because they were serving an audience that was paying 2000 a month. So if I could build a news operation fast enough, and I literally built it uh, one by one, reporter by reporter, based on the on how often, it, uh, on who were the, what were the highest traded stocks by day trading. So if, if the highest traded stock was Yahoo, then, I mean, that was the first company we covered. And if I could hire the second reporter, it was the second most active stock or, or, or category. So it was internet stocks, it was whatever. And one by one, I would, as I could add reporters, I would fill in and get deeper and deeper into the trading world and build, ultimately build something that was somewhat competitive. In fact, uh, Thompson, at one point, three, when we, a couple of years later, Thompson came to us about being helping create a news a news uh, service for them to compete before they before you were there. That was like 1999, 2000. We actually did. They helped finance part of. They were another partner helped finance growth in our newsroom by us uh, building out more for them. So uh, I went to these guys, and after about two years, it was now 95. I said, "Oh, this is going to be big." I mean, boom! Everybody was day trading. It was, things were really popping. And I really wanted to go out and start a company. And I really wanted to roll this out and create an internet news company. And, but I had no money, uh, and no real money. And I went to the guys who ran this company. I said, I'll make you a deal. I think I can create something huge here. And in two years, within two years, I can roll it out to a separate company. And if you guys will fund me on it, let me stay here and fund me. I want X percentage of the company for me and for my employees when you roll it out. I'll bring you a media partner because we're gonna to need to sell a lot of advertising when we serve that. There, the one thing I learned from both sports and financial news was there's a, there's a category of people who pay a lot of money for real-time data and news, the, the bookies or the heavy traders. But the next person will pay nothing. They want it, but they, they're not making money on it, they're not gonna pay for it. And I said, so I think that part of the business, which is the one I wanted to go to, was going to be basically an advertising supported business. Had to get mass, and quickly, and we could get advertising to support it. And um, so they, uh, on a handshake, they agreed. And two years later, uh, we built it up under data broadcasting. Two years later, I rolled it out into a new company called Market Watch. CBS was our media partner for, CBS paid no cash. We put no cash into the company, got 45% of the company, but they gave us $15 million worth of promotion on the CBS television network and its subsidiaries and the ability to license the, the eye, to become a CBS product, which they had never given out to anyone else at the time. They were just giving it to us and to Sportsline, another website. We, two of us came in with the same idea, and over a course of seven months, we got both negotiated deals with them and started those companies, um, started these new companies. And, you know, it, went, it was gangbusters. It was in, in 15 months we went public, uh, with $7 million in revenue and no profits, maybe a nickel in profits. Um, and uh, the, the uh, demand for the stock was so intense that they couldn't open trading on the first day. We were going out at $17 a share. It couldn't open until 3.30. First share traded at 65. In that last half hour of the day, it hit 130. Settled at 97, which gave us a billion dollar market cap. Seven million in sales, a nickel in profits in a billion dollar market cap. <laughs> a longer story, which I won't go into, about how we dealt with that. But, you know, we, we wrote it, we stayed high for almost a year in the 80 to $100 a share range. Uh, I bought everything I could for stock, three companies and did everything, I mean, I knew this couldn't last. And then everything crashed, but we had a strong company. We had good cap, time we crashed, we were, we were marginally profitable. We had like 35 million in revenue and we were a real company and uh, had built out other revenue streams besides advertising, like licensing our content, things like that. And then uh, called the whole staff together in 2000 when it all crashed and said, this is the way it's supposed to be. We're gonna reissue options. We got the SEC to approve a, a basically a start over 
on options because everybody has these options at eighty dollars a share. And uh, over the next five years, uh, the company grew, 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 and uh, the demand for what we did got great. We were the difference between being able to do it on the web and being able to do it professionally. You know, started to come together. We were doing a lot more of what Dow Jones and Bloomberg were doing. Ultimately, Dow Jones decided they had to own us because and they learned that they protected their audience by buying, by charging for Dow Jones content on the web. They, they, if you remember, the Wall Street Journal was one of the first to charge, and they were, they charged, and they protected that product. They felt by not giving it away for free, um, and that they couldn't give it away for free. But they saw in their research for the first time that a couple categories of investors, self-directed investors and college students, preferred MarketWatch to any Dow Jones product, and that was a that was an eye opener for them, and just they decided they had to own it, and they went after us with a vengeance in, in uh, 2004, and it was a surprise to us. And I immediately, I was CEO. It was a publicly traded company. I, we had a board of directors. I had to call everybody together and say, "We got to see, do we want to sell this thing?" And immediately, CBS decided they had to own it after not after seven years of being a part owner and never once suggesting they'd own the whole thing. They had done it. We didn't know why, but coincidentally, they were about to split from Viacom. And they needed an internet strategy because all the internet companies were going to Viacom. So we had that dynamic going on. And we went out and got five companies silent, quietly. To Every company we asked if you're interested said yes. We had this great bidding war go up, and we sold it in January 2005 for $528 million. And, and to imagine that, a, that the number one financial news company in the world would, uh, which had 2,000 financial journalists, would spend $520 million to buy a company with 120 financial journalists who did essentially the same thing is pretty amazing. But it, it, it's a testimony to how clueless big companies are about how to serve <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, uh, So that was the story of Market Watch, and there's a lot more fun stuff in between, too. But I, I guess you, you touched on a great point that I just want to highlight because, you know, in the, in the financial media sphere, in the media sphere in general, things are changing so fast. I think what, what you t touched on that, that struck a nerve for me is that financial media has a competitive advantage over traditional media in that you pay more for better, timely, more informed content. You're not going to pay more for a ca better casserole recipe, but you're going to pay more for better financial content. So you can tier the content structure. We do that at Minion Bill. Most of our content is free. We have products that we now license content. But it's an important point, you know, we're talking about financial media and financial tech, that I think is, you know, you look for obstacles. Again, another great point, obstacles are opportunities. They have to be as an entrepreneur. Right. That's the one thing I've learned. I've learned every day I tell my, my team that obstacles are opportunities. We can't do this. And we can do that. We didn't get this deal. We're going to get a better deal. And it's, it's always going to be about that. But that's, those, that's, those are the two points that really stuck out for me. You have to see the world. You have to see the glass half full if you're an entrepreneur. You have to always see where it can go and what, what, it, uh, what it can do. And, and what, what possibilities there are now, not what's blocking you. So those are five different, very different stories about how people got to where they are. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but I'd love to, whenever you want, raise your hand and I'll go out to the audience for a question uh, to anyone or about anything. But one of the subjects I wanted to talk about here and get you guys, and get your um, uh, take on is New York. You know, I started my business in California, even which actually is counterintuitive because I didn't hire any of the people everybody was hiring in California, the young sort of internet uh, uh, generation. I mean, everybody I hired were, you know, reporters from Reuters and AP, and they just liked to move to California, and they liked, uh, uh, you know, doing what they do. It was a better gig, and the newspaper industry was screwed up. So it was, and, and it's even worse today. Um, but here in New York, we've had, uh, you know, a, a lot of, uh, of uh, problems in the banking industry, a lot of problems in technology, early, older technology businesses, uh, and the media world, all of which have had, you know, layoffs and, and you know, has that helped? Um, and and were you, have you been able to raise money uh, easier, or is it harder or easier to raise money in New York to start a business? Uh, well, New York was really instrumental in building celerity. It seemed like when I was networking, when I didn't have a job, it seemed like everyone that I wanted to meet or I would hear about was in New York City or, or would visit New York City. So meeting people like Roger Ehrenberg, who's now a prominent venture capitalist, 
uh, you know, you meet these people that were right at your doorstep. So it's pretty amazing. Um, if you look at what's happening in New York City right now in the banking sector, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of great engineering talent where divisions have been laid off. Um, but on the other side of that, you know, the, the, the talent war has really heated up with people like Facebook building an engineering office in New York and, uh, you know, LinkedIn and Google. Uh, a lot of the social media startups, uh, you know, are really flourishing in New York. I think, you know, New York now more than ever is an amazing place to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you know, you have these really prominent VCs that, uh, you know, have opened up a lot of doors with uh, things like Betaworks or Techstars where you can get access to, to really successful entrepreneurs, really successful, uh, successful venture capitalists. And it's just, uh, it's been incredible just to see the shift in three years. So New York City, I think, is on par with anywhere else in the world in terms of, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and, and engineering now. What about money? Were you able to do the venture group, or did you? Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Roger Ehrenberg is one of our investors, and, and we raise money from wealthy angels. And, uh, you know, New York City, again, was kind of that hub for us. So it was instrumental in, in raising money, it was instrumental in networking, and it was instrumental in, uh, you know, finding the right talent. Yeah, on our side, I mean, we, we are maybe a little bit more traditional in some sense, but um, we're also a bunch of uh, real guys originally, meaning that nobody in the VC world, nobody on the Friday is <coughs> invested in us anyway, so it was fairly simple. Um, but uh, New York for us is, is absolutely essential. Uh, essential because that's where, honestly, still today, 60% of the financial innovation happens. Uh, it's because that's where there's the biggest clients, uh, right there. So, uh, you know, I'm exactly uh, in five blocks from Fed Street, my home firm. You know, I can go anywhere and very sure so where I uh, And uh, these are our relationships for some years, so it's they are very important. You know everyone, it's a, it's a community. Same for my side. So, we, uh, we clearly leverage that. We leverage also the, the people. I mean, in our business, you, you, we don't do any sort of outsourcing at all. I mean, everybody's in our office. I can touch all my developers. <laughs> and I prefer <laughs> that because we have to move very quickly. You know, when, when something has to be done, it has to be done immediately. And uh, we made the choice. And if you look at that, we have really fundamentally four development centers. Uh, small one in Chicago is mostly uh, London, New York, and Tokyo. And you're telling me you're absolutely crazy. Uh, and that's true, but if you look at these three, uh, I, at one point for the price of two people in New York, you had one in London. So New York has a very good cost advantage here. Uh, taxes, it's a totally reverse story, but in terms of uh, the quality of the people you find, their expertise in the market, uh, the, the way you can leverage an incredible amount of business knowledge, it's, 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 it's irreplaceable in our business. It's that simple. Um, you can find great engineers everywhere. You know, but I agree with you. I think right now for fintech we have a real challenge because when I see uh, uh, young startups, you know, on the uh, media side, advertising side, uh, offering the salaries they're offering, it's incredible. It's going to be very difficult to keep our guys. Uh, fortunately, the banks are firing, so that should <laughs> exactly make a change. Um, but and I think the, the structure there on our side is uh, we are fundamentally into young, which is rare at the level of the world. Well. <coughs> And uh, that's why we have kept a lot of good people because more it's everybody in the firm is a, is a shareholder. And without that, we can do it. Uh, no question about it, despite the fact that we pay very, very competitively. But when the bank starting to increase the base salaries, it was very difficult uh, in terms of uh, cost ratios. So uh, overall, the office is, uh, in my opinion, irreplaceable. I mean, for us. Uh, from a talent perspective, um, <laughs> you know, Wall Street pays better than uh, internet software startups, uh, period. And I think one of the challenges that software companies have had in New York in prior decades and in prior eras has been competing with uh, banks and even financial technology firms that sell very heavily into banks uh, for New York engineering talent. You don't really have that problem in San Francisco or the Bay Area in terms of acquiring the talent. You're going up against Google. I mean, there's plenty of you know, uh, competition out there, but you're not going up against Wall Street organizations and Wall Street compensation ranges, which are fundamentally different from internet software, software as a service, uh, engineering um, teams, and the way you think about compensation. So I think uh, the, you know, the, the, 
demolition of a lot of investment banks over the last few years has been good, and I think it's opened the door for a lot of true internet entrepreneurship to emerge in New York that's wholly separate from financial, you know, financial technology uh, in entrepreneurship. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, hopefully it stays that way. I think it's great for there to be a whole bunch of different entrepreneurial categories that are, you know, based in New York, not just, oh, this is either, you're either a Wall Street engineer or you're a FinTech engineer or you're headed to the Bay Area. I think it's great that there's engineers that are developing in Python and Ruby and a whole bunch of open source languages and they're working on web applications for all different kinds of customer bases, not just for, uh, for Wall Street. Wall Street had a bad habit of wanting to do it all by itself. I mean, every bank wanted to have its own internal homegrown system, which seemed to have been a problem for years, right? I mean, because they'd always, they, they build them. I mean, I, I mean, Bloomberg really was an outgrowth of the fact that, you know, when he finally built one that worked, he really took it out of the company. Thanks, thanks to Merrill. Yeah, Merrill. thanks yeah. to Merrill, right? And, but but is that is that one of the reasons why we're seeing so much now? You think we're where they? I mean, have they learned their lesson? Are they still trying to do it inside, or you know, do they? Are they getting it? Are, are you able to build things that they want? Yeah, so I think it's very very clear. I mean, right now, I think I, I know six of the twelve top firms who are completely setting out their internal systems as as quick as they can. And the reason for that is that they they are honestly they are five and they will be involved. So they need somebody to pick it up. And uh, I think it's very simple. I mean, we, we know the metrics very, very well. I mean, uh, if you develop a bank, it's going to cost three to five times more than developing a company like one of ours. And uh, I had a, a deal with server because I had access to a lot of data. And it's very simple. All these systems are monitored in a big way, all above 10 million bucks a year. At right. last. So it, it's almost impossible for a bank to develop as efficiently as a company who's still be focused on that. It just doesn't work. And it's becoming irrelevant because fundamentally the, the richness of the of the environment is to have a lot of pockets and so it's a lot better for them to concentrate on things which are highly profitary like the algorithm we mentioned or all the type of technologies or research or whatever and to produce something that they all consider today as a pretty um, you know name and everybody can do it. <laughs> also on the on the news side of things, one of the trends has been uh, the sort of devaluing of commodity like news. I don't mean commodity co coverage of commodities. I mean news that's a commodity where so if everybody can get a press release, you know, you that you bring somebody a press release doesn't mean nearly as much anymore. You're not going to get paid for that on the web produce, publishing press releases. Um, it does mean, though, that there's a higher value placed on the on curation. Yes. I mean, one of the things that's happened out there is there's so much information available to everybody. No one knows what's important and what isn't important anymore. So the idea of curating, e even in real time, whether it's you, the way you do it, which is you know using technology to look for certain clues, or the way you do it with your own writings or the writings of several of your columnists, you're curating. You're taking bits of information that you're being exposed to and you're passing on them what you think are the most important ones, the fastest, and trying to put context around them, right? And is that, a, is, that, is that something that's going to change the media world in New York, too? I have to tell you, I'm so ADD that I'm sitting here listening to all these smart people talk that I forgot I was on a panel for a second. <laughs> um, um, well, it, it's a bit different. I, this, these are all really you know, thought-provoking uh, discussions. Um, I think in terms of location-based, you know, it, it really comes down to culture. Uh, the type of people you attract uh, is always going to be a bigger, better thing. This is New York City, after all. Um, if somebody is looking for money, there's probably going to be somebody with a better offer. We, we've trained a lot of really good kids that got poached away by 3X offers that I was like, hey, you know, good luck. Uh, you can't really compete with that. Uh, but it, you know, in, in terms of curation, I, I think you know it goes back to what I said earlier. It, you know, I, I don't sit there and you know regurgitate what what I'm seeing what I'm seeing on Bloomberg or through my uh, e-signal platform or whatever it is. Um, you know, we operate with a forward-looking lens. Our mission, I <laughs> forgot to say uh, before, is to affect positive change through financial understanding and do that up and down the vertical from the ABCs to 401ks, but our, our nuts and guts are really at the top of the pyramid. 
uh, you know, so we look at it with a forward-looking lens. So we're assimilating information, we're di digesting it, and we're formulating a sphere of, of opinions and commentary, uh, not advice. Uh, I think the fatal flaw of financial media uh, is that you don't know the time horizon and risk profile of your audience in an in a internet age or a television age, and to try to address that, I think, is, is one of the fatal flaws of financial media. Uh, and in terms of information deflation, thousand percent. It's like swimming up a waterfall every day, uh, you know, competing with what's out there. But I, you have to believe that there is an HBO to the basic cable universe. There, you know, you want to watch Nurse Jackie or Entourage or Shameless or Californication, whatever it is, and you're going to pay some more for that. And, and if you know, I think that has to exist if there's going to be any type of hierarchy uh, in the media world. Uh, I'm betting my career on it, uh, but you also have to diversify because you're going to be wrong a lot. Um, so um, I think that was the question. Yeah, that's a good. <laughs> um, now you're in a you you you're in a uh, a business that uh, creates news digitally. It kind of skips the except for your one guy in Australia, <laughs> you know, who, they, who's, who you have because they tell the FM, right? That's exactly right. Okay, because the law there said you have to have at least one human. That's exactly right. Um, Outside of that guy, you're you're taking, you have algorithms presumably that scour the internet, pull data together, and present it a certain way quickly, machine to machine. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's you know high performance curation, right? Using machines, uh, there's been an explosion amount of the real time content, not only the amount of content but the distribution channels. So you know, for example, the, the press release distribution, right? Used to stick with large press release wires, and it, it still does, but the SEC stated that a company can put their press release on their website. So you had, uh, you know, the number of channels go from three to thousands, and that's just in the U.S. So you have financial professionals, you know, trying to monitor for the gems that they're interested in. So, you know, we're in the business of, of you know, delivering the facts associated with an event. And uh, some companies are looking at sentiment, but our customers, you know, they want the gem uh, that sparked the conversation on, the, uh, on Twitter. Right, they want the Richard Branson saying, you know, Virgin Atlantic is going to buy more Airbuses, and that sparked this massive, uh, you know, signal throughout the market. So we're using armies of algorithms versus, you know, armies of journalists in many ways to find this breaking information that financial professionals care about. And um, you're right, a, a press release, you know, that's uh, becomes commoditized in, in maybe minutes. You know, there are traders that pay for that information on the millisecond scales, and they pay a lot of money for it because there's both uh, alpha generation opportunities but risk mitigation. So a lot of the automated market makers, you know, have traditionally just used market data in their models, but now they're trying to incorporate other factors like news and events so they can get out of the way. Um, so you know, when a dividend comes out, an equity options market maker might want to remove liquidity based on an event. So it, it's interesting because if you look at a human trader, their two real time inputs are market data and news. Where Celerity plays is, um, you know, in this event data space where trading machines, just like a human trader, need to understand news and events, both real time and, uh, you know, calendars and things of that nature. The impact of, um, of the, the, what's happened in technology over the past 10 years in entrepreneurism is enormous. And, and uh, you, you have a, if you have a great idea, the ability to bring it to market or to make it real is so much faster today because of the technology that exists. Uh, I'm, I'll give you just a one quick anecdote. In the early days of Market Watch, in 1997, 1998, we had an idea that one of the things that would really be cool would be to create a real-time news alert. That if a news story happened, we would be we would email you quickly, right away. We would send an email out if you signed up for this service. If a big story broke, we'd send you an email saying big story, right? And it seemed like such a simple idea. We thought people would like it. And we thought we got you know, 10, 20,000 people sign up for it. We, we put it we, so we created this thing. In the course of uh, three weeks, a million and a half people signed up for it. So we knew we were on to something. That was the good news. The bad news was when we sent out a, an alert, a big story broke, it took an hour for everybody to get it over all these new early stage email systems, you know, AOL and through us. <laughs> And it was crazy. So we, we called a meeting, and I got everybody together and said, look, we got to fix this. we got to be able to communicate with people in seconds if something happens. How do we do that? Can we build the system ourselves? My CTO said, I can do it for you, but it's going to take 
roughly half my resources for the next six months. And it was like, I forgot what the dollar number was. It was maybe $200,000 of, it was four engineers' time over six months. That was his estimate of what it was gonna to take to build a system that could blast emails. That was gonna use like a, a whole wall of servers and he had all this software they had to create. And I said, well, let's do it. It's that important. We think it's that big an idea. So we built it. And it did take roughly the time and money, he said, to build it. We launched it, and it was magnificent. I mean, we got, we were so fast on stories at no other news sources that we started putting out general news, you know, over headlines for CBS using our own system, because nobody could touch us. And we probably got a four or five year head start on anybody being able to do it as quickly as we did. Um, but it I bet half the, of our cost structure on doing it. If that same idea came to us today in a conference room, we'd just look at each other and say, Twitter. That's it. We'd have, we, if the content was good enough, we could get the content fast enough, we could all put it out on Twitter, and it also means that the next guy can. And, and so you have to say is that, is, so now the fact that the plane hit the building a minute, 30 seconds later, is a commodity. And it wasn't a commodity when we started. It changed. But the technology is dictating a big change in how you have to approach what you're doing. We have to do more than just tell them something happened. Now, now it's not about breaking news, it's about breaking views. It's about being able to give people context in real time. Um, and if you look at the world of you know, weekly news magazines, that's kind of what the daily newspapers are today. You know, they're, they, they're not even taking that much more time to tell you what happened the next day. They have to tell you tonight anyway on their websites. But the, you know, the, a, a weekly news magazine seems so old and so out of touch that the only chance they have, you re really look at Time or Newsweek, is to really be looking the way Todd said he tries to do, is to look ahead. You know, what's going to come up in the next week? What's, and that's what you're about. You're about the future, not about the past. It's not, it's, not just, it's not just looking ahead. It's looking at the landscape <laughs> of probability. And this is probably where my derivative background plays most into the media side of the equation is you look at the probability spectrum and you look at uh, the variables and the potentials on the horizon and you pull together a mosaic of, of, pop, of possibilities and probabilities. You know, we, we talked on Minionville, you know, in 2007, we talked about how the financial industry was effectively insolvent. And, uh, and, and it was not any great math, it was looking at the, FASB 187 at the time and saying, you know, if you, the, the capital ratios, if they pull these bad, these toxic assets onto the balance sheet, you know, all, all these banks are done by a factor of four. Uh, and they're all insolvent. And we, you know, we, you know, we got branded as bears a little bit, but, you know, we had, I remember we had an article, it was Dead Banks Walking, it was Lehman Brothers, it was a bunch of, it, and one of them was Washington Mutual, and Washington Mutual happened to be an advertiser. And, you know, Dead Banks Walk and Washington Mutual, brought to you by Washington Mutual. And, uh, <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, you know, the, the pre president called us and said, pull that content or we're pulling our advertising. It was a $60,000 advertising. We're not insignificant for a small company. And we're like, I sat back and like the author, Ben Sudaka, may rest in peace. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not telling them. You know, well, we tell them, told them they were not gonna, we're not gonna pull it. He's like, we'll cancel our advertising. We said, fine, you're out. And uh, sure enough, a week later, they went bankrupt. And uh, two weeks later, we got the check. And I said, "Go cash this." At <laughs> <laughs> um, another bank. But it, you know, it, it's a bank. I will tell you this: I was at a board meeting today, uh, and, and uh, you know, kind of a off-the-cuff board meeting. And we talked just about this: about how, how media companies can no longer be media companies; they have to be technology companies. Uh, and and it's that's part one. Part two is that any brand, any company in a digital age has to be a publisher. And that's where we've adopted our business a bit because now we're offering third-party solutions to brands who have no idea how to be publishers. They just know how to be brands in the financial services arena. And we can now customize a content offering, meta tag to their portfolios that when their customers come in in the morning, they can say the news that matters to them, the videos that matter to them. And, and, and it's really about adopting. I know nothing about technology. I'll raise my hand. I, I'm, I, I'm listening to you like, wow, like that's really cool. You know, I wish I knew that as a trader to be able to look at this news, and, and you're doing really cool stuff too, by the way, we gotta talk. Um, you know, but, but, but it's about finding that healthy balance, and, and, and for me, it's a never-ending search. Well, that's a big, uh, big point, though, is, uh, and, and uh, I spent two years working on a book about a lot of this, but the one of the basic conclusions is, 
every company's got to be a media company now. Every company has to maintain a, a, an ongoing relationship with many constituencies, with its, with its customers, with its stockholders, with its employees, in a way they never had to before. It has to be conversational. It can't be, you know, even advertising, it can't be one way anymore. You, you know, it, 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 advertising is storytelling just like journalism. And, and journalism in the old days when you, when I was a newspaper editor, you ran a story and the end of the process was the stories published. And as an editor, it used to, I used to have this thing in the pit of my stomach every day when you realized 10 minutes after the papers were printed, something was wrong. And, and it was gonna be a full 24 hours before you could fix it. And you were in the mid, mid, meantime destroying somebody's reputation or doing something terrible to somebody. And it was like, oh God. And, and it just it was the way it was. Nothing happened in those 24 hours except somebody get went crazy. And, and today, when you publish a story, it's the beginning of the process. Now, you start getting emails, you start getting things, and, and you're, it's expected, it's a higher standard. You're expected if that story's gonna stay alive on the web, for it to be accurate to the best of your knowledge. And that doesn't mean just the facts, that means the nuances, that means the, you know, the subtleties about it, the context you put it in. Some of those things may change based on new information you know, and you have to go back. It's a living, breathing organism. And people come back at you, and, and in the old, when I was a, a reporter at the Washington Post, I'd have a front page story that I thought rocked the world. You know, and, and two weeks later, three letters would arrive at my desk from somebody who read them, and I'd go, wow, see, this is really cool. When I started Market Watch, about six months into it, I wrote a column for Market Watch, and I, I, I had been writing a lot at that point, but I started to write some more because it's, you know, there's infinite amount of space, it's Market Watch, right? I, I wrote a column, and in half an hour, I had 500 emails. And I said, oh my God. It's a totally different world. It's a, it's a world where everybody's communicating, where you want to enge engagement, this mysterious world of engagement that the advertisers are using is real. People feel like they want, they want to know from each other, they want to know from a community what they should do and what's better, and you have to provide that. The content is currency. It is. So it's a very interesting spot. Uh, Go ahead. Not, not the good, uh, um, that is the, I think it's Come up questions. Uh, we're going to stop this in a minute or two, so if you don't have any questions. It's, it's an incredible opportunity right now, I mean, if you look at it, because um, you have the Antar, this is a more oriented fintech, it has media, but in the fintech world, you have a, a gigantic regulatory impact, yeah. multiple layers, you know, Volcker Rule, Dodd Frank, you know, and so on, capital issues. And uh, then you have a massive technology impact, technology is cheap, it's available, uh, everything is moving to the cloud, or credit, whatever. Uh, so you can do things you just couldn't imagine before, like financial front figure or whatever. And then you have a liquidity revolution. I mean, the people who are participating in the market have totally disappeared. And nobody knows who is going to replace them. So if there is no opportunity now, there will never be opportunities. It's incredible. I mean, you can match trade, you can create new instruments, you can do it in all ways, whatever. It, it, it's, I think it's the best period to do anything that I've ever seen in my unfortunately arrest to be long carrier. It's incredible. When I started the company, it was not bad. No, it's absolutely fantastic. And you know, you, are, you can even fund in a lot more easy uh, fashion than when I started. I mean, I, you know, mostly I was funded by my friend in Wall Street. That was it. I thought the most interesting funding uh, story I read in the last week was this profile of Kickstarter. I don't know how many of you read it. Kickstarter is this great little, dip, you know, internet company that allows you to contribute to somebody's effort. Somebody puts up a company they want to start, you don't even buy stock in it. You're not actually buying stock, you're just contributing. And, and a lot of the places, one of the companies was a company that was gonna make a watch, and it was very cool looking watches. And if you contributed $100 or more, you'd get a watch. That's what they promised you. That was it, no stock, no anything. The company raised $7 million. I mean, Which is basically, exactly the amount I raise with you see one investor. So, yeah. <laughs> so and, and not one of them has more than a hundred bucks at stake, though, and you don't get calls from them. <laughs> it's a, but it's a really, it's an interesting. One. I know a friend of mine who's just opening a play off Broadway next week, actually this week, that he funded entirely out of Kickstarter. They raised seventy thousand um, dollars. They they've been working on this play for years. It was the first chance to actually raise money. They don't. Nobody's expecting anything back. If you, depending on how much you gave, you got a certain amount of tickets, you got whatever. But they basically funded the whole thing and got it out. And, and it's going to be staged for several weeks. They got a theater, they got all. Are you uh, 
I contributed. I'm saying, do you have a, a role in the play? No, no, I, I, sh I should have for the thousand I gave him. He was a good friend, so I gave him a thousand dollars, and I was like, you would have thought I, I financed his kid's education. It's good to be your friend. Called me, yeah. <laughs> he was, he was uh, he, anyway, he's, it, it's a really interesting thing in the show, and my wife's in Broadway, involved in Broadway, so I don't actually don't expect money to come back when you put it into a play, so it's okay for me. <laughs> uh, but, Okay, um, I know I'm supposed to tell you too that there are surveys on your seats when you came in. If you could, they're about, I think, doing business in New York and, and it's a broad, it's not about a survey of if you like this or not, because we're all too thin-skinned to hear if you like this or not. But it's, uh, it's, it's something that the club would like you to fill out if you can on your way out. Uh, and I'm, I really would hope, uh, I'd love to take any questions if anybody has them, uh, or we, we may have put the entire room to sleep. Um, if, uh, and in fact, there was no reaction to that. Means that it did. <laughs> uh, anyway, yes, go ahead. Um, there's a point of view out there that says uh, it's not beneficial for society as a whole for institutions to pay up to get information faster and quantitative trading to have a millisecond edge versus others. What if somebody just wanted to talk, talk, to, talk about the, you know, the big picture of? of well, I think I think that's a, it's part of a big, even bigger question yeah. about can is is there more ability to for corruption for the problems because of a highly automated world? It's easier to job a system than it is sometimes to use human, corrupt humans. I think you have two two different problems, and you must separate them. The first problem is uh, fairness of access. You know, can everybody access at the same speed in the same way as the market? And I think that should be a very basic rule, respected by everyone. And then you have the second one, which is uh, how much money uh, do you allow people to put on this? And I think they are, you know, it's kind of free market. And so the first thing, well, a lot of exchanges now, I don't know if you know, but I mean, I wouldn't say it's a good one. You, you have everything in the market right now. You have exchanges who have sold at a premium price the room around their core engine. Maybe not very acceptable because it's one firm in some cases having all the shortest access. So you could claim, you know, what's the difference between that and phone running when you do it on the phone? And I'm not really sure, and I'm maybe not qualified to answer, but there are questions. And you have some other exchanges that have taken the other view, and you are in the same data center, but you can be uh, at the beginning or at the end of the data center, they give you the same length of cable to maintain parity of access. And I think this is going to be regulated, in my opinion. People are going to say fairness of access is a must. Everybody should have it. So I don't know how this applies to the news business because I know it less. Well, there, there is. I mean, from a derivative trader standpoint, I'll tell you, it's a double-edged sword at this point. Uh, you know, some estimates that black box trading, if that's what we're referring to, is upwards of seventy percent of volume. Uh, you know, I talk about this a lot with you know folks at the exchange and folks who make money on this and. The, the unintended consequences, there are always unintended consequences to a lot of these regulations. I, I don't have an opinion either way. I mean, I, I think that the, the, you know, I think it's kind of gotten away from human traders, and I think that's a shame. Free market capitalism, it's a different conversation. But with black box trading representing 70% of volume in some cases, if you pull that away all, all of a sudden, then you're trading by appointment again, and we're, we're taking the market back, you know, many, many years. Some people would say that's that's probably a good thing. I I'm just taking the other side of the trade on that, just pointing out that the caveats of, of you know of doing something like that. Oh, oh, from my perspective on this, uh, I think um, I think a lot of it depends on who you're developing the product for. I think uh, if you're developing your your technology products for a very concentrated incumbent base of customers that have enormous operating leverage around the information that they can acquire or the tools that you're giving to them, then you're probably just advancing a, an advantage among incumbents. Uh, but there are a lot of examples of you know entrepreneurship and internet companies that are creating information and delivering it at either zero cost or very near zero cost to a whole population of people who have never had access to it. And there's a lot of implications for what happens when you start to do that in 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 different markets? I mean, I, I can I can only speak for my own company. We we're delivering information to a set of business owners that have no idea what their business is worth. They have no idea how they should think about selling their company. Who might be the the ideal buyer? That's uh you know 
that, that's a big that's a big change from you know none of these guys are going to buy a $25,000 license to Capital IQ or to FactSet data systems, those are really, really high price point products built for power users in financial markets. When you start taking that information and you deliver it for free to business owners, uh, you can start to really take technology and information and not just use it to advance the advantages of the incumbents, but you can actually use it to turn whole markets upside down. So, um, you know, I think hopefully there'll be plenty of market opportunities for people to, to not just build products that serve the incumbents, but also build products for, for new markets. And as long as those companies can ultimately find a way to generate an attractive return on capital through a business model that serves a new audience, then you could have a lot of uh, sort of incumbent marketplaces sort of turned upside down over the next couple of years. Okay, anything else? Oh, yeah. Um, can you guys talk to more of a general question? Can you guys talk about um, how you think about creating a liquidity event in your businesses? Is that kind of what you guys are striving for? Certainly, those of you that are venture back probably aren't here in that direction. So, how do you, I mean, what, what, what's the strategy behind that? Okay. Well, I, I'll just go because I happen to have a mic in my hand. Shocker. Um, <laughs> Years of trading stocks, I've never made money buying a stock for a takeover. Never buying a stock for a takeover. I have made a lot of money owning a stock that has great management, strong fundamentals, a good looking chart, and I like the story. That happened to get taken over. And that's a, sort of the same philosophy I had running the company. Like, you tell me, you know, what, what's your exit strategy? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think we'll get bought or we're going to build a great company regardless. And if you keep doing the right thing long enough, you hope somebody eventually takes notice. It's not the answer that everybody wants. I don't have five big money backers. I put you know, millions in myself and, and, and was very judicious raising money along the way when we needed it. And when we couldn't raise money anymore, we said, okay, well, we better get cash flow positive. Otherwise, we got bigger problems, and we did. Uh, so we've been very lucky in, in some regards, but we've also, you know, it's not that, it's not that kind of glib that to say, well, you know, hopefully something good will happen. There is an exit strategy. I'm saying there's a lot of things you can't see, and, it, and usually, as Larry will talk to, uh, it, or has talked to, uh, you never really know. I mean, we were approached, uh, I can't name the company, by one of the biggest financial institutions in the world uh, to buy us as a consumer face. And I would tell you, I didn't see this coming from any direction. Uh, the deal ultimately you know, fell apart, not for price, but for reasons that had nothing to do with us. But I would have never saw, saw a coming. But you have to, you know, oh, when I was talking, to, when I was out in Palo Alto a couple weeks ago, and I listened to Jeff Weiner at LinkedIn, who I'm very impressed with, with their story. And he said that his focus was, you know, his, I asked him, what's the, what's, the, what's the secret sauce? He said, focus, 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 but remain opportunistic. And I'm like, how do you do that? Like, you know, like how do you, you know, and I'm still trying to figure, but they use the analogy that if you're sailing a ship, you try to keep pointed, you know, what direction your ship's going to, and understand there's going to be waves, there's going to be squalls, but keep your nose of your ship pointed in the general direction of the horizon you want to go to, and you hope that, uh, you know, you catch a good gust. Yeah, let me just say one thing about it. When, when um, there are two things you have, two, two key moments, I think. One is when you're starting a business. You really want to stop and think about what potential exits there might be. So in the case of MarketWatch, we had big, two big shareholders, right? We had CBS and Data Broadcast, two very different companies. One we ultimately thought might be the buyer, one might be the seller. But but for whatever reason, we decided at that moment, one of the, even though we used the CBS name, that we had to work harder to give ourselves maximum flexibility. That we wanted everything we could get from CBS that would make us better and help us grow fast, but we also didn't want them to be the only buyer. That we couldn't get so close to them that nobody else could ever buy it. We, we were thinking ahead of what it would be, you know, what the options would be. So we, we knew what we didn't know, and we spent a lot of time keeping our options open. So when decisions had to be made, we made decisions to be good partners with CBS, but we also stopped ourselves at certain points where we said, you know what, that's too deep. If, if we're that close to them, nobody else is going to be able to buy it. So we had that kind of thinking going on. The second thing happens at the moment you get that phone call. So when Dow Jones came to me and said, we want to buy you, I had to stop. I had to think about the company at the time. We had $15 million in the bank. We were profitable. We could have gone on for a long time. 
and we were having a great time. It was a terrific company, we had lots of fun, and it was really going, things were going well. But I had shareholders, and suddenly I had some, a, a company, and then two companies, and then five, who were going to bid each other up to a point where I knew about where we could get maybe the highest we could get, what that would be. In fact, I underestimated that. But even knowing that, I said, okay, how long would it take me to get the company to be worth that number to my shareholders? And is it fair to make them wait? You know, it, it was, it was going to take, I thought, five or ten years for me to be able to get the stock price up on the, the business that was going up slowly. It was two, four, six, eight, ten over five years. But we were talking about $18 a share. And, and it's a publicly traded company. And it was, they were all cash deals. So I had to sit there and say, you know, really, how could I say no to a deal? How could I look a, a shareholder in the face who would sue me if they could see that kind of money coming out of a deal like that? You, when you're a public company, you have to worry about your shareholders and are you doing the right thing for them. So it, it, you, you'll see the set of decisions that matter occur when you get that question, and they're all different. But up to that moment, what you want to do is give yourself maximum flexibility. Try and anticipate any possible acquisition, any possible moment. And today, for instance, it's very different if you're thinking about than it was 10 years ago. You know, IPOs were on everybody's lips 10 years ago. M&A is probably a bit much bigger possibility now. But you know what? In six months or a year, the IPO market could be on again. Facebook goes out and it rocks. Couple things happen. You could be looking at that. So you've got to think now about from starting something up. What are the various possibilities? How much this should I try and keep ownership to myself if I'm going to start something? And how much can I give away? And what's the likelihood of, of what will it mean ten years from now? What will it mean five years from now? And you have to set your own time frames. The biggest deals that have problems are when you're involving people who have different time frames. If you have shareholders that you know, want to be out in three years and shareholders that don't care but just want it to grow and you have other shareholders who want to be out in 10 years, you've got a problem. And you've got to manage that problem very carefully. You know, and, and you have to convince everybody you're doing the right thing for the best possible group, but you're going to have issues. And that answer, like, like he pointed out earlier when you're talking about um, you know, it, uh, uh, everybody, the risk assessment of people or trying to give advice, the reason it's so hard to give advice is everybody's got a different set of, of risk uh, 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 risk metrics. You know, I, I don't care. If, if I've got time, I want it to build out into something great. If I've got a fund that closes in a year, I may want that thing sold pretty quick. And so you've got to, you have to deal with both kinds of investors too. But you've got to really think about it. Don't just start thinking about it the day you get the offer. You've got to really, hopefully, have anticipated all the possibilities. Yeah, I think the only thing I would say regarding that is, you know, you, you'll talk about your exit strategy when you're raising money. Uh, but I'm a firm believer in running your business as if it's never going to happen. Because you just don't know what that time right. horizon looks like. So, you know. You just know it's longer than you thought. That's exactly <laughs> right. So get to revenue as fast as possible. Get to profitability as fast as you possible. You need more cash than you think. Yeah, yep. absolutely. But, <laughs> but run your business as if it's never going to happen. I think that's the right, the right strategy. And, and uh, just to comment on that, I think there, are also, uh, there is also a very important point on the employee side. Um, because the most impatient sometimes can be the employees, right? Because they sit on stock, they don't write back elsewhere else, you know, they ask questions all the time. And I think one of the way to do it, which we've done in our case multiple times, it's uh, every time we did some kind of a restructuration, we didn't raise a lot of money, to be honest. We, we raised really one round and a half, I think. We did use the rest, stay in the bank. And uh, I bet we had to do other rounds to reorganize our show. Right? And every time we organize a new exit, of the employees, so they were always able to exercise some stocks. We also did dividends once, you know, just to keep the people realizing they're real, they have real money there, and they're not, it's not a dream which never comes through, you know, because that's a problem. You cannot demoralize your, your team. I would say that the, that's also a unique benefit of being totally employee owned. Um, there's not a lot of companies that are venture backed that would probably. It would just be difficult to pull something like that off if your business is venture backed. Um, so I think you just need to answer for yourself what kind of company do you want to build and then build a capital formation, you know, a, a capital base around you that's as closely aligned to that as you can possibly get, which is hard to predict. But if you want to build a very big business, then you can raise venture capital. But if you want to raise a small, smaller, profitable business, um, 
maintain control, pay out cash to your colleagues, your partners. Um, don't raise venture capital. Uh, don't, certainly don't raise institutional venture capital. You might raise you know venture capital from your friends and your family, but don't you know because you you will get pushed all the way to the largest b business you can build with the big best venture capitalists. That's what they're in business to do. Well, so they'll, they'll push you for that. They're on their schedule of funds too. But, no, I mean I, on the con I think the best venture capitalists do not in impose. Their schedules. I think they're, that what they impose is for you to not sell the business for a hundred million, but to sell the business for a billion or two billion. So, I think the the best venture firms usually are very patient, but they will push you to build the biggest company you can possibly create. And that may not always be the best thing for you to do. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel. Very much. Thank you.